It's so difficult because relationship issues compound over time, and they do often in our brain and hearts. And yet we are different people throughout the course of our relationships, especially if you have a long term one. You're different people all over the place throughout the course of that relationship. And you may not be the best person at all times in your relationship. And then you may learn and grow and be a better person. And the same is true for your partner as well. Welcome to the Multi Amory Podcast. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. We believe in looking to the future of relationships, not maintaining the status quo of the past. So whether you're monogamous, polyamorous, swinging, casually dating, or if you just do relationships differently, we see you and we're here for you. On this episode of the Multi Amory Podcast, we're answering questions from our subscribers and delving into some of the most challenging aspects of maintaining healthy relationships, including rebuilding friendships with exes after long periods of time, setting boundaries through self discovery, managing unmet needs, providing advice for polyamory newbies, managing feelings of comparison, and overcoming relationship trauma. Join us as we share personal experiences and insights on how to navigate these tricky situations with grace and understanding, or at least do our best to do that. We do need to give the disclaimer right off the top here that we've spent a ton of time studying healthy relationship communication, but we are not mind readers yet. We're working on that one. We're also studying that one. I would love that. Yes. (laughs) If there's some new study out there, then please let us know. We will we will get on that. And our advice is based solely on this limited information that we have. So please take it all with a grain of salt. Really, every situation is very unique. And and we encourage all of you out there to use your own judgment and definitely seek professional help if that is necessary and needed. And I would argue that professional help is always a good thing, just in general. If you If you can do it, go do it. And ultimately, you are the only true expert in your life and in your feelings your decisions are your own. So go out there, live your life, take what you want from this episode and then leave the rest, whatever doesn't work for you. That is totally okay with us. So with that, let us get started. This first question is a doozy. I don't know. It doesn't, I guess it doesn't have to be a doozy. For me, it, it really read as a doozy first time out the gate. But how do you rebuild a friendship with an ex after a long period of no contact? I know I have done that. Have y'all done that before? Yes, I have. No, I would not say rebuilt like a romantic relationship again. Well, this clarifies a friendship, yes. Okay, yes. Yeah, I, honestly, this immediately it made me think of the relationship that's not a romantic relationship, but a friendship that ended badly. Your friendship ex? I, oh, a, fr- oh. a friendship Frex. ex. Yes, that I wanted to try to rebuild or was in the process of rebuilding and finally was able to rebuild, which is great. And okay. I think that, yeah, that just much of that happened through time. My very good friend after Jason and I became polyamorous was not really interested in having much of a relationship with me. And yet over a long period of time we she sort of said yeah you know what if you want to do that or if whatever it is that you're into and interested in that's totally okay I just kind of needed to get over it and I needed some time to myself and I think it's better now and and that was that was good it it really just took a little bit of time away and I'm not saying that that's the answer to everything because time doesn't necessarily heal all wounds but I think it does at least put some perspective on a situation and allows you to like take a step back and and let your emotions heal a bit. After that period of time away with your friend, like who, how did you get back in contact? Who reached out first? How did, how, like, what were the tangible ways that you rebuilt the friendship? I think 
anytime I would come back to Tucson, I would still try to reach out. And that sort of escalated into us being able to like have a conversation and talk and go out to dinner and just have a an okay, normal time again, which is great. Especially with certain people in your life, you're able to come back and have it be as though no time has occurred sure. at all, yeah. except for hopefully just time of rebuilding and healing. I have a couple different examples that come to mind. One is a case where I had a breakup. This was back in college and had a breakup and we hadn't talked for a few years and we got back in touch online, kind of trying to be friends. And we just really quickly, I don't know, activated something in each other that just ended up hurting feelings again and, and just like not being a good combo. Oh, so like you were both still too just like on edge or like triggered that's poked at all that stuff. Yeah, it was like we had too much history of upsetting each other that it we just tended to assume that's what was happening, even if it wasn't. And there were some just looking back kind of silly misunderstandings, you know, that I had and that she had. But it was this indication of this is not the right thing to do. And so we didn't. We just pretty much after that happened and it happened right away, right? Kind of in our first or second conversation after trying to reconnect. And it just sort of didn't go well, and we just stopped being in touch. Now, fast forward another, I don't know, 10, 15 years after that. Wow. Uh, now we'll message each other sometimes, uh, you know, and share memories from college or whatever with our group of friends and things like that, and it's fine. But we haven't had a close relationship again. Uh, but then I have other examples of people that, you know, have been in a romantic relationship with, we've broken up, and then maybe even... A year later or a couple years later, we've been able to reconnect and I've actually had some kind of a nice friendship, even if it's not a super close one. Not to say that it couldn't be, but it just hasn't been for me in those cases. I've definitely had that experience that you talk about, about trying to rebuild a friendship and then it's just way too activating. And yeah, there have been, like I'm thinking about a specific relationship where I think I just overestimated how chill I was. Or my ability to be chill. Yeah, interesting. You know, totally. like overestimated, like, okay, I think it's been enough time. I think I'm over this. I think I can still connect to this person. We were good friends. Like, this will be good. And then the instant that I reconnected with them, it was like, oh, shit. No, I'm just like instantly way too mad and needed more time away before being able to actually reconnect with this person. But then I've also had experiences rebuilding friendships with exes where it went really smooth and it was okay. I think that... My experiences have sometimes, when it's been successful, I think it's fallen into two different approaches. Either when I'm reconnecting with an ex, it's someone where we have the time, bandwidth, energy, maturity, and skills to be able to sit down and maybe have a little bit of a clearing the air sort of talk, you know, to be able to sort of complete things, right? And it doesn't mean that you necessarily, like, like I've never sat down with someone and necessarily done, let's unpack every single argument we ever had in our romantic relationship, but we're able to talk about, you know, maybe where what we where we think things went wrong. Maybe some there's an exchanging of taking responsibility, like, yeah, I think I really misunderstood you in this way. And the other person's like, oh yeah, I think that I didn't communicate super effectively. And those conversations have been really healing for me with certain exes and enabled me to actually have a friendship. So I feel like it's like either you need to have the resources to be able to accomplish that together. Or you need to be grounded enough to be okay with it just being water under the bridge and something where we may never go back to this and clear this out and come to any kind of conclusions. We may just have to decide like, okay, we're going to be friends and then that's just all in the past. And, and I think that's the situation where for me, there has to have been enough time past for me to feel like I've done my own healing work around it and I don't necessarily need to do that with this person in order to move on. At least that's what I think of when I think about all the times that I've successfully rebuilt friendships with exes. And I'm happy to say that I think I have a lot of exes that I've been able to be cordial with or maintain friendships with. But I also have a lot of exes where that's been impossible or inappropriate, Likewise. you know. On so both accounts. I, yeah. I think in the non-monogamy community in particular, people feel a lot of pressure to be friendly with their exes. And it's not bad pressure, right? You know, especially a lot of people are hanging out in the same community spaces or they're still connected via a weird tangled polycule or whatever. So I do think it's probably good to try to set up a situation where you can be friendly or you can be cordial. 
And also, if you're in a situation where it's not possible for you now or ever, I think that's okay also. And it might not be something that they want to do either. Yeah. So if the question is about, I'm thinking about this person and I want to see about reconnecting, I think one, if it's been a good period of time, it's very likely that that other person also feels similarly removed from whatever it is that caused you to break up before. That they probably also, a lot of it's gone away and they're okay with it now. But realize that they also might not be. To them, it might still feel fresh or that might still be painful depending on what happened or any number of other reasons why they might not want to reconnect. Maybe they're in another relationship with someone who would be very jealous and upset about them being friends with an ex or, you know, there's any number of reasons there. So I think what I would just want to throw out there is if that's something you're thinking about, I think it's okay to, to reach out and just say, Hey, just thinking about you, wondering how you're doing something like that. Give them a little context to know this isn't, doesn't have to be super serious, but if they don't react well, that's also fine too. And maybe in another year, they might be the one saying, Hey, gosh, I was still dealing with some stuff then. You know, it's like to realize that this isn't your one and only try, so you don't need to push for this to be something and you're not failing by not being friends with this person. I think just on a final note, just get really clear on why it is that you want to have a relationship of some sort with them again, because yeah. sometimes that is just maybe I am interested in getting back together with them in some way versus I thought the, our connection was great and I really would like to have this person in my life because... I value them in a variety of ways that aren't necessarily romantic. Yeah. And be open that they might have different expectations too. 100%. Yeah. All right. Let's, yeah, let's go on to the second question here. What was your process? Oh, so oh yeah. I didn't realize this is directed <laughs> uh, directly to you, Jace, or the three of us. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> what was your process of self-discovery like, especially as it relates to learning where your boundaries are? Did you do this independently or inside of a relationship? How does it continue to grow and change in your current relationships? That's a big one. It's so covering a lot of ground mm -hmm, there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, this is a perfect opportunity to tease one of the tools in our book. We came up with the Yourself tool, which is our tool. And of course, classic multi-amory acronymization <laughs> of literally everything. <laughs> to help figure out what your boundaries are. We do want to record a full episode dedicated to just that. We haven't done that yet. But uh, if you want to pre-order our book, you can go to multiamory.com slash book and get that pretty soon. Yeah, this is, uh, again, boundaries are such a tricky topic. Something that I've come around to in my life right now is I feel grateful that I've had a lot of experiences, not only of times where I feel like, you know, someone hurt me or crossed a line in some way. And then I realized retroactively like, oh, that was that was a boundary or I should have put up some more firm boundaries with this person or in this situation. I've realized this after the fact. And so now I know going into the future what to do. But these days, what's been on my mind is thinking about boundaries in the sense of, I don't know, thinking about what's actually worked for me, like what's created more joy and more safety and more peace in my life and in my relationships, as opposed to looking at my boundaries as though like these are the things that I need to protect myself from all the enemies that are surrounding me or all the people who want to violate me or, or cross these lines or I don't know if that makes sense. I, I think that I've had a lot of yeah. painful experiences that have created a particular sense of boundaries, but then I feel like I'm also learning to more proactively create my own boundaries around the things that I want to be doing, like with my life or my schedule or things like that. I, and I guess the example that comes to the top of mind is like boundaries around my relationship to social media. Honestly, mm. you mm. know, um, like having to put in, like literally paying a company to prevent me from going on social media at particular hours. Like I, I use the Freedom app, I pay for it. And noticing that like that's created a lot of more of a sense of joy and peace and presence in my life to the extent where now when I am on social media, it's really easy for me to maintain that boundary because I'm pretty much immediately anxious. And then I'm like, okay, let's get the fuck out of here. Wow. You know, and That's so good. that that yeah. didn't require necessarily like, oh my God, someone in particular attacked me or hurt me. That was about how do I want to create more joy and space in my life. And so that's going to require these particular boundaries. Maybe this is going way to like 301 level too fast. 
with this, but that's just what's been on my mind and heart recently. It's what they've been paying for, Dedeker. That's what the listeners want. <laughs> <laughs> that's so interesting that you bring up that concept of looking at, you know, what are the things that make me feel good? You know, how can I have more time for those things? And what are the things that don't make me feel great? How can I move away from those rather than just that I have to protect myself against this attack or whatever, right? And we often talk about boundaries as being this last line of defense rather than the thing you you lead with, right? It's that idea of, you know, the bumpers on my car are to protect me in the times where I bump into something that I didn't mean to, but you're not driving around by scraping that bumper along the sides of the road <laughs> to get yourself somewhere. And so that idea that boundaries are really important to protect ourselves but ideally, we want to not have to use them or or bump up against against them very often, if if possible, right? And so it's that kind of moving away. And I was just thinking while you were talking about that with social media, that for me, something more recently has been sort of a personal internal boundary on how much of my emotional bandwidth I'm willing to put toward someone else in terms of, um, you know, stressing about like, is this person okay? Mm -hmm. Or did this person maybe not like me based on not a lot of evidence? Or I know I do that one a lot, right? But, but I've started to approach it more from this sense of, you know, what am I putting my energy toward rather than is this about them or not? Right? Because, because if I'm just thinking about it, it's like, oh, do I worry and care about this person? Well, yes, I do. But if I equate that with, you know, worrying is how I show that I care about that person. The only person who's hurting from that is me. And the person who's benefiting from that is nobody. So kind of that way of, of just, again, to take boundaries in a different direction of how they affect my life more personally and not just about what I'm okay with putting up with from another person. And I almost, almost feel like as I've moved more toward that with boundaries in terms of my relationships. Now it's more if something's heading in a direction that feels like it's going to be bumping up against boundaries a lot, I'm able to earlier and a little more gently just kind of, I'm not going to be so close in this relationship, or I'm just not going to go that direction and try to avoid myself even getting there in the first place. I think that for me has been the big change from way back when we started this show to now. Mm, sure. We do talk in the book and on the show about how the best relationships, I think the healthiest relationships are going to have less of the fear involved in, is this person going to bump up against my boundaries or not? That it's sort of coming from a place of assuming that that is just probably not going to happen that often. And I'd say that it still probably will happen from time to time, and that's okay. Because we're all learning and, you know, our partners are mind readers. And so they're not going to know unless you make it known to them. I know for myself, generally in my life, just have really wishy-washy boundaries. And I like let a lot of people take advantage of me in my time. And that's something that is my thing to work on in general. And so in terms of a self-discovery process, it's just been a long, long slog of needing to realize that my time is valuable and that my sense of self is valuable and okay enough to be able to set things down and to say no and to put myself first in situations where I generally just don't. And that is time and age and I guess being too old for some of this shit. repetition <laughs> of doing that so many times and being like, that's probably not the wisest thing to do anymore. And that's tough. Yeah. I feel like just to keep on taking this to like 401. Yeah. I've been really thinking a lot how, how much sometimes our self-worth and self-esteem can be tied up in how effective our boundaries are, I think, or how effective we are at enforcing boundaries. Because I know for me, if there's an area of my life where I feel like, Ooh, if I, say no to this or negotiate in some way that makes me a bad person or a selfish person or someone that doesn't deserve to be in a relationship. For me, this is a big one with work, to be totally honest. You know that I sometimes have a hard time having a boundary around my own work, right? And it's because I work with people 
And I have the sense of like, oh, if I say no to this person that I work with, they're going to think less of me. If I don't agree to this thing this person is asking, they're going to ditch me or they're going to dislike me. I guess it starts to relate to the stuff that you work on, Jace. But there's other areas, honestly, in my relationships where I feel pretty much a pretty solid sense of like, oh, I can say no to X, Y, and Z to like this plan or this sex act or having this particular conversation or I can negotiate that, but I feel secure like, oh, this person's still going to love me. And that's going to depend on the relationship and how good your communication skills are at being able to like compassionately enforce that boundary. But yeah, I think that's interesting that that it seems like this isn't, at least for me, not an across the board thing, but it's like certain areas are really easy to enforce boundaries for me and certain areas are not. Yeah, I think that's a great note on the process of self-discovery because I was just looking back at the question here to see what the actual question was that was asked. And it was about the process of self-discovery as well as how does it continue to grow and change? I think we've covered quite a bit of that. But the one middle part of this, just real quick, is do you do this independently or inside of a relationship? And I think my answer, just real quick to that one, and I'm curious to hear from you, Dedeker and Emily, but for me, it's definitely both. I think a lot of the boundaries are more personal. And so it's just taking the time to think about where my own energy is going and what, what's been good for me and what's not, and how to, I guess, get ahead of that, like I was mentioning. But also, I think that having had a lot of relationships and also talking to other people about their relationships, even just friends and things, not necessarily in a professional capacity, has really helped to inform those things. Because sometimes you just don't even know what there is to think about or to strive toward or to move away from until you've had some experiences. Yeah, I think you need experiences to be able to figure out what your boundaries are. But some of those will happen independently of other people. It's not just necessarily going to be, I'm in this relationship, so I'm learning this thing that I don't like about being in relationships or whatever. It's also, I'm having this experience that's telling me that this is something about myself that perhaps I need to alter or look at or think about. And that's putting a personal boundary on things that you also may not be great at. Like that for me is a huge one. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I think it really depends upon the situation that you certainly can have self-discovery within a relationship, but you also will have so much outside of them. Mm -hmm. And that's necessary. So let's move on to our next question. When there's needs being unmet in a relationship and your partner promises to do X, Y, Z differently, how do you come up with a timeline to give them space to implement the agreed upon action points versus just constantly being promised they'll do better without real follow through? Yeah, that's a big one. I think a lot of people complain about that one. Yeah, I think... Something I just want to look at right away is the fact that they use the word action points, which Thank to you. me means one, they're probably talking about this in a radar. Yes. And so as they're doing that, they're getting to action points. And I would say that just as a place to start is when this happens, often it's because the action points are kind of what are you actually going to do that we can point at and say, yes, that thing was done or this thing is being different because of it's exactly this. Those need to be clear enough. They need to be specific enough. So, you know, something like be nicer Not is hard to say, oh yeah, I did be nicer, right? That's difficult to point at and say, yes, that happened. But something instead that's, I'm going to come in and give you a kiss in the morning before I leave for work, mm. or I'm going to send you a good morning text, or I'm going to remember to text you on my lunch break, or whatever it is. It could look a lot of different ways. And I'm just picking this one particular example, but something that's more concrete. And then I would also add, could have a time frame on it. So something that Dedeker and I often do in our radars is if something comes up about, uh, so let's take a positive example, something we want to do, like, oh, we want to actually go out and have a date where we get dressed up. We'll put not just the action point of we want to do this specific thing, but we'll also put a time frame, often before the next radar. But even better might be, we're going to do this two weeks from now. So there's even something a little more specific, so then you're not trying to cram it in at the last minute before your next radar. 
or something like that. Uh, so I would say just to step back from the question and say, look at those action points. Are they specific enough that you could even say yes or no, this happened? And that both of you would be very clearly in agreement about that. And then also having a sense of how long will that take? What's the timeline? And if you can't do that, try taking a bigger concept and break it down into some smaller pieces and then come back again, make some more smaller pieces. Yeah, I was going to say that specifically, that you can have like micro check-ins essentially that aren't necessarily having to do a humongous radar again because those can be daunting and sometimes a little scary to do every month and to know like, okay, we're coming up to this and we're going to have a big dump of all the shit that I did wrong this month. <laughs> I think can be implemented in like bite-sized chunks. Just, hey, how do you feel this went this month? Or how do you feel this went in this two-week period, for example? And have it just be about that as opposed to a bunch of other things, perhaps. That might make it a little bit more palatable. Yeah, but I think having the intention and hopefully a shared intention of let's follow up on this in a couple weeks or in a month, or let's set some time aside to talk about this again. That I've seen is probably your best tactic for not falling into that situation where you're just, you feel like you're just like waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting, you know, and like, do I bring it up? Do I not? You know, why do I have to be the one to bring it up? I'm just going to sit here and wait and test my partner and see if they ever remember it. Like no one wants mm -hmm. that shit at all. No one wants that shit, you know? So that's why I think it really is important that, I don't know, when you're collaborating with your partner, you're able to decide when you're going to follow up on this. And I know that can sound weird. It can sound formal. But again, it's it really is just figuring out how do we set ourselves up for success here so that you feel, you know, the person that I'm making a request of, you feel like you're able to do the things that will help make me feel better in the relationship and myself, the one making the request won't just be sitting and wondering what's going on, right? That like we we close the loop on this essentially. Because also life happens, right? You know, so sometimes I've made a request of a partner and they forget to do it. And then like between now and our next check-in, I'm like, oh, why did they forget to do this? So neglectful, yada, 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 you know? And then we come to their next check and they're like, oh my God, shit, I totally forgot. I said that I was going to do this thing. I'm so sorry. Like, let's put that in the calendar now or whatever. And it's just like purely just human brains not functioning versus someone being like, I don't know, an ass to you or something like that. Yeah, I just want to throw out, assume good intent and try to have you and your partner be looking at the thing that is a problem that you are coming together to help solve. And I think it will hopefully differentiate in your brain that my partner is doing this thing to me or I'm asking them to fix something about them, but rather I have a need to feel more secure in my relationship or something along those lines. And so I'm asking that of my partner instead of getting pissed at them. It's like, let's come together for a solution. I, I That's something that is hard. It's, it's hard. really, really hard. Yeah, it's hard, especially if there's a dynamic where you feel like criticized or yeah. feel like, oh, I'm failing my partner and I feel this shame. Or if the two of you only ever have these kind of talks in the context of a problem, that's why we're so very mm. pro radar, pro check in is it's so important to have this channel open so that, you know, if you're the person who has a complaint or a criticism, you're not just like the parent or the boss having to tell you yeah. what to do. And then I check in, like, are you doing the thing that I asked you to do or like be the taskmaster or whatever that again, like it's so important to have that channel open so it can feel more like more of a collaboration rather than a, I'm your boss and you're the employee and you got to do what I have to say. Yeah. And I think just to go back to what Emily said of it's us against a problem can be a really nice way to approach that action point step of, okay, we both agree this is something that we want to change. Maybe we have different reasons for it. Maybe it's because I want to feel better and you want to make me happy or vice versa. But we both agree we want this thing to change. So then okay, what's the action point version of that? And that's a collaboration. And also when will this happen can be a collaboration rather than one person demanding or requesting that of the other. And again, if you're completely lost when we're talking about radars, if you have no idea how to have a check-in conversation, go to multiamory.com slash radar. 
We're also going to be covering this in our book. So you can also, once again, go to multiamory.com slash book to get more information about that. So before we go on to our next few questions here, we're going to take a quick break to talk about how you can support this show. If you value this content, if you appreciate the fact that we put this out there into the world for free, which we love doing, it really goes a long way for you to take a moment to check out the sponsors of this show, visit them if they seem interesting to you, listen to them. It does directly support our show whenever you do those things, and we really appreciate it, and we look forward to continuing to bring this to you for a long time. Let's dive into our next question. How can I let go of previous relationship trauma so that it doesn't taint the future of the relationship? My relationship with my partner is fantastic, but previous transgressions against the relationship feel hard to shake despite previous efforts at forgiveness. Okay, so I initially misread this question. I thought that this person was saying I was previously in a bad relationship and I'm worried about that tainting the current one. So if that's the case for you, that you're struggling to feel like you can relax and enjoy your current relationship after you've left a bad one, you can go check out Multiamory episode 376 where we dive into that. But yeah, this is a little bit different. This feels like it's starting to speak to feeling resentments, having a hard time forgiving a partner, having a hard time repairing stuff that happened in the past. And I think that Dedeker, when you read the first question of today's episode and you said it was a doozy, I think this one's mm-hmm. actually the doozy. Yeah, you're right. Because it's it's hard, right? It's hard and the advice out there in the world, and we've looked at this before, for example, when we did our episode on forgiveness, when we were researching this for a couple past episodes, so one is 342, which is to forgive or not to forgive about sort of the concept of forgiveness in general and some of the research about that as well as episode 354 called Rethinking Resentment. But what I'm getting at here is that the advice about these is hard because often people will come out with very clear advice of like, this is the thing that you should do, or this is how you can forgive, or this is how you can move past trauma, or this is how you can rebuild trust in a relationship. And the problem is that it it really depends so much on the context, on what happened, what's been actually done to repair that, what's changed, how long has it been. There's a lot of factors that go into it. And so I can understand why this person would reach out with the question because it's hard to find good advice about it. Because you'll go one place and it's all these things about like, here's how you forgive and that's what you should do. And then other ones where it's about, no, actually you need to make them earn it or you should just leave or, right? There's all these different things and it just it's such a hard one because there's not one clear answer and people get more clicks on the internet if they give you a clear answer. And so that's why you find a lot of that. It's so difficult because relationship issues compound over time Mm. and they do often in our brain and hearts. And yet we are different people throughout the course of our relationships, especially if you have a long-term one you're different people all over the place throughout the course of that relationship. And you may not be the best person at all times in your relationship. And then you may learn and grow and be a better person. And the same is true for your partner as well. And I think so often so many people get caught up in, you know, well, I remember when you did this and remember that thing. And I'm not saying that that trauma isn't there and that we shouldn't acknowledge it, but we should all also try to acknowledge the people that we become mm. and the lessons that we learn. I wish sometimes that that is the case more, that we are able to forgive more than perhaps we want to. Yeah, I was going to say, I think that's like a necessary factor to have a healthy relationship. It's because inevitably... because yeah, we're going to yeah. hiss each other <laughs> off and fuck each other up and... <laughs> It happens. Yeah, I mean, not to normalize any kind of toxic or like straight up mean behavior, but it is just we're going to bump into each other. We're going to step on toes, right? We need to have some kind of way of being able to forgive and move on and not just pile up a grudge or a list of wrongs. I like to think about these situations, especially when I'm working with clients. I like to like hit the fast forward button or imagine that you're stepping in a time machine and like jumping to the future of the relationship. Let's say we skip past all the hard work. You know, we skip Hmm. to the point where you have forgiven your partner. And like, how would you know? You know, how would you know that you've forgiven your partner? How would things be different? How would you feel different? How would, what different thoughts would you be thinking? What different feelings would you be feeling? 
And that can give some insight into what it is that's missing or what you're craving or maybe clarify what needs to be worked on in the relationship. And if this is something that you're working on with a partner, if the two of you are able to talk about this, that the partner who feels like they haven't been forgiven because that's a shitty position to be in also, right? You know, the partner can think about, okay, again, if I fast forward into the future, how would I know that my partner has forgiven me? What are the things that I would notice? How would they talk to me? How would they treat me? How would I, what are the thoughts I'd be thinking? What are the feelings I'd be feeling? Like you can, again, that can also help to clarify what might be missing here. And if that's just like way too much, this is also a great exercise, again, to do with professional help, either individually, you know, working with an individual therapist, coach, counselor can help you figure out what's missing here or together with your partner as well. Yeah, I want to come back to some of the wording in the question here where they say, my relationship with my partner is fantastic, but previous transgressions against the relationship feel hard to shake despite previous efforts at forgiveness. And so we've been talking about the forgiveness piece, and I think that's valuable. But I think the other piece is the trust piece. And trust and and fear, I guess, which are sometimes related, but not always. And so a couple things to think about with this is, one is we don't have any context, right? I don't know what these transgressions were, how long ago it was, what's been done to change that what mitigating factors there were. I I don't know, right? So this might really vary depending on those circumstances. One thing to think about is the pain or the hurt from that whatever happened can still be there and can still be valid. But looking at what's the evidence I have now, right? Is it that I'm afraid this is going to happen again because I don't really have any evidence to show me that it won't? Or is there even evidence to say that it might still? Was it related to some other behaviors or some things I see in my partner that I'm still a little bit concerned about? And it also, maybe it's just new, right? Maybe it just hasn't been that much time yet. And how much time is all relative. But to look at, you know, what's the evidence I can point to and say, actually, here's the reasons why it is different. And this is why that's not going to happen again. Or at least I don't think it's very likely to when you try to step back and look at the evidence, because it allows you to acknowledge, I might still be upset about it sometimes. I might still think back on it and be pissed off about it. That that doesn't necessarily have to then mean, oh, and my current fears about it, I should I should be listening to those. On the other hand, you might say, I've done such a great job forgiving. And when I look for evidence that anything's changed, I don't see any then maybe it's like, hey, great for you that you've let that go. But also, this maybe is a thing to still be concerned about. So that's just one, yeah, that's, one approach to look at that. That's a really good way to flip it on its head and think about that. Alrighty, let's move on. What are some of the best ways for veterans, quote unquote, to give newbies advice? Friends, family, lovers. Sometimes you know there will be some resistance, sometimes none at all. Plus, so many choices are very personal. Understanding informed consent is something I always try to lean into. I'm assuming in this case they mean newbies to non-monogamy or polyamory. I'm assuming that as well, and veterans uh, of polyamory as well. I don't know. It could be for paintball, for all we know. That they wandered into the wrong Discord. But it's... (laughs) It's interesting that they're talking about friends, family, and lovers, that all three of those potentially will be different, which I think Mm. they certainly can be if you're going to be giving some sort of advice or talking about something very specific within your relationship. You may want to be gentler around certain groups of people, perhaps. Yeah, well, I think this person mentioning the informed consent thing is Mm -hmm. key here, right? And so it's don't be giving advice that you haven't been asked for. Don't be assuming that you know more than this other person necessarily in all situations, right? I found myself wondering, this is maybe adding another question into the mix, but randomly this morning I was thinking about, is there ever a situation where it's appropriate to quote unquote pull rank in the sense of, I've been doing, I've been successfully non-monogamous for 10 years and you've been successfully non-monogamous for six months and trust me on this one. Just trust me. Do you think there's any situation Mm, where that's appropriate mm. or do you think it's always going to be something like, I don't know, that's going to be going too far? I, I would take it back to what Emily was mentioning about the difference between what is your relationship to this person and 
I'm always hesitant to make, you know, sweeping declaratory statements, sure. but I would say that when it comes to a lover of your own, like an, a romantic relation of your own, that's never appropriate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I just think that's a line you don't want to cross. It's a dynamic that should be there. Well, that's like a power there. play there a little bit too. Yes. R right. It's just so rife with opportunities for that to just go really badly, uh, right? Even if it doesn't go badly at first, and even if it comes from the best of intentions, that's just not a healthy dynamic to have in that relationship. And I do want to clarify that maybe you do have some kind of intentional power dynamic in the relationship, you know, like sort of a kink dynamic of some kind that involves those types of roles of kind of giving instructions and following instructions, for example. But when it comes to this type of thing that's that's outside of that play, that's more of I'm actually just trying to help you live a better life or trying to give you wisdom that I have in those romantic relationships or those intimate relationships, I just don't think it's appropriate. Um, when it has to do with their own relationship with you that way. It's just not, I've never seen it lead to good relationships. And so I really don't recommend it. Even if you think it's working in the short term, it, it usually doesn't. Now, on the other hand, if this is a friend, I could see an opportunity for, or a family member that, you, you know, they're wanting advice. Again, so the consent thing, they want the advice. Yeah. And there might be some times where they're like, well, but I think this might be okay. If you're like, no. Look, I've seen so many people, including myself, think that they could do that and that it would be okay. Just just trust me on this one. It's not. And realize they're probably still going to do it anyway. But like, at least you said your thing. You're not going to stop them from it. But I think in that case, it could be okay. It's so funny because, Dedeker, you have talked about this a lot that there are people who come up once they hear that you're non-monogamous or or write you or call you like past people that you've been involved with and say like oh guess what oh, hey. like me and my <laughs> wife are maybe interested in trying this out and now, anytime, if you have any advice or if you want to sit down for coffee yeah, and just chat yeah, anytime or something along those lines. I hear from a man it's usually a man anytime I hear from a uh -huh. man that I've not heard from in at least 10 years and it's just like, a, oh, hey, I'm always like, you and your wife tried to have a threesome, right? <laughs> like, Or you and your wife just opened up your relationship, right? That's, yeah. And most of the time, it's accurate. So maybe in that scenario, go for it. Just lay it all out. <laughs> I don't know. It does depend. But yeah, it, it's going to be very specific to the scenario and the person that you're speaking to. And I do agree with you, Jace. It's tough because... Sometimes when you have multiple partners, you want to come to a partner as more of a friend for advice. Oh, yeah. But it's it's mm -hmm. so it's so challenging because you don't it, it, there's so many things that can color that relationship and that experience and the discussion that you may be having with that person. So I hear you. I hear what you're saying by just like just don't when it's romance. But it's, sometimes I want to come to a partner as a friend and be like what do you think about this? This sounds la la la. Well, Just kind of yeah, thrown in their general point. direction. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's a great point. I do want to clarify. I'm not saying don't ever give advice to them, but don't ever do the pulling rank. Like, yeah, I, I know what I'm talking I, about. Just sense. do what I say. That's more, that's more what I'm getting Insidious, at. I think as far as giving advice, it, it is tricky and you got to be a little bit careful there, especially if you're clearly more experienced with anything right with relationships in general or non-monogamy or whatever the context is just be careful because as the one with more experience your partner will often take you more seriously and take you at face value and maybe they shouldn't maybe they should be questioning things and figuring their mm -hmm. own stuff out a little bit and that doesn't come from any ill intent on either of your parts but it, that's an easy place to go so just be extra careful in that situation also let me just say be extra careful it does, it does not matter how many years someone has been non-monogamous unless you know <laughs> unless you've been there for all 10 years of that history like it, they could have been doing 10 years of fucked up non-monogamy for all you know <laughs> like right it, and this is so tricky because we're in a community where we want role models and we want leaders and we want someone who has gone before us mm -hmm. to point out where the obstacles are and where the potholes in the road are and some people can do that. Like, yes, there's a certain amount of knowledge and information that is helpful in that way. And also just just be careful. 
just that's all I have to say. You know, yeah, that's all I have to say. Yeah. So I guess to wrap up this one a little bit, I did want to say just that even if you've been doing something longer, like Dedeker said, you know, the other person might not know what they're talking about if they've been doing it longer. But if you're the one who's been doing it longer, you also only have your own experiences to go on. And that may be completely different from the person you're talking to because of their personality, because of their past, because of the way they want to do relationships. There's a lot of things there. So I would just be careful of approaching anything with too much of an absolute. You know, maybe you're like, no, I've really seen evidence that this goes badly. If you do want to try it, you know, especially look out for these things, but I've just never seen it work. I really recommend you don't. Is better than just don't because I said so, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, and I think that's a maybe a good little note to end on is if you're giving advice to someone who has specifically asked for your advice, you have to learn to not be attached to whether or not they actually act on that advice Mm. or not. That's great. That's (laughs) going to save you a lot of heartache and frustration in the end that, yes, you can give what you think is absolute gold and they may not take it. Doesn't sometimes. matter. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, that's so true. And maybe they'll make the mistake this time and think back and then next time they'll remember your advice, right? You can't can't control that. All right. We have one last question that we want to get to today and that is, how do you manage feelings of comparison when you're going through a hard time with a partner whilst they are having a great time with other partners. This is the worst. This is the worst situation. Of all the questions, of all the questions that were submitted, this was the one in our Discord server that the most people reacted to of like this, yes, this. So I wanted to be sure we got to this one. Also, I wanted to give props to someone using the word word whilst in a sentence. I love that. I'm assuming you were from like the UK or somewhere. Oh, I was oh, assuming perhaps. you were from 1598 yeah, no. or something. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I love the word whilst, just fun fact. It's such a cool word and I don't use it often enough. Uh, but yeah, so feelings of comparison, when you're going through a hard time with a partner whilst they're having a great time with their other partners. Oh. Gosh, this is hard. There's so many hard ones today. But yeah, great questions, everybody. And I think the low-hanging fruit, and I don't want to just say this and have people groan into their podcast players or whatever, <laughs> the low-hanging fruit would be, well, it's it's about working on yourself. It's about finding self-love. It's about doing things <laughs> that make you happy regardless, because sometimes it's not going to really do anything. And sometimes maybe you just have to live in your feelings or talk to a therapist or talk to your partner and say, hey, <laughs> I'm having a rough time here. So can we do something about that together? Can we proactively help the two of us feel like we're getting a fun, good time out of this relationship at this moment, because my feelings, and not that this is necessarily reality or truth, but my feelings are telling me that you have a better time with other people than you do with me. This is, And that's a, that conversation is a great candidate for being really clear about what it is you're wanting out of expressing that yeah. to a partner. This is a great candidate for the Triforce. If you don't know about the Triforce of Communication, go check out our Fundamentals episode about that. Because, yeah, you can be coming to a partner with, I really want some action on this. I want us to problem solve together. I feel like we're having a hard time and I feel like I see you having a great time. And so how can we make this relationship feel more fun or great or smooth or whatever it is. It could just be, uh, you know, what we would call a T2 or like just wanting empathy or care, right? Where it's like, I know we're going through a hard time. It's really stressful in our lives right now. I know there's nothing we can do to change it right now at this moment. But, you know, can you just like comfort me and hold me and understand my feelings about that and how that's hard? And in my personal experience, I've also gotten a lot of value of being able to just T1, as in just express it to a partner without an expectation that anything's going to change in that moment, right? Like I've gotten a surprising amount of benefit from just being able to say to a partner, wow, I'm I'm just feeling really envious right now hmm. of what you're experiencing that I'm not experiencing. And really clarifying, that's it. Like, I don't need to respond to this right now. I don't need to fix it. Like, just want, I just want it to be known. I just want to be heard. I'm experiencing a lot of envy right now. And maybe that is, maybe then I'm like, okay, I know that I have this under wraps as in I can go do my own self-work or comfort myself or self-soothe myself, like if that's the appropriate situation, right? Yeah, I think that's a really important thing to think about from that teamwork with your partner point of view. And I think that 
another way to approach this is from the, what does this look like for me if my partner is not part of this equation at all? Right. And that's mm. you know, maybe easier said than done, but just as a mental exercise to think, okay, I'm having these feelings of comparison in that I, I think they're having this great time with their other partners. At least that's how it seems to me. And maybe that's what they're telling me. And I know I'm struggling in this relationship to look at, okay, if, if I am leaving out just the part of me comparing, what is it that this is maybe bringing up that I wish I had that I didn't? Or what's a feeling I want to have that I'm not having? And look at, are there some ways that I could be getting even just a little more of that, right? Even if it's not, oh, okay, cool, magically I fixed the problem. But if it is, I want more physical affection. Like that's the, that's the thing I keep coming back to is like, that's what I'm so upset thinking that I'm not getting and I'm, I'm sad about that. Maybe looking at, are there ways to either ask for that? Are there ways to get that from other people, potentially in a more platonic way? even? Or is it about, I want someone to just like get to know someone and have new experiences? That also could mean going on dates, but that could also mean finding a new community, connecting, you know, going to a meetup group in your area or joining a new discord, uh, you know, finding people with a common interest, something like that of kind of looking at, you know, what's the, the thing I wish I had more of and this isn't going to fix it overnight, but it at least might give you a proactive place to be focusing on when you're thinking, gosh, I'm just sad that I don't have this other thing. A big thank you to everyone who's in our private Discord group and our private Facebook group for submitting these questions. And we would love to hear more from all of you out there. We have a question of the week that we're posting on our Instagram story, which is, how do you manage feelings of comparison when your partner has more dates or other plans than you? Uh, this could also be a friend or someone else that you're comparing yourself to, but we'd love to hear about the ways that you deal with that so that we can all benefit from each other's ideas. The best place to share more of your thoughts with other listeners is in this episode's discussion channel on our Discord server, or you can post in our private Facebook group. You can get access to these groups and join our exclusive community by going to patreon.com slash multiamory. In addition, you can share publicly on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Multiamory is created and produced by Emily Matlack, Dedeker Winston, and me, Jace Lindgren. Our production assistants are Rachel Shenowark and Carson Collins. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. The full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com. 